So the next step is to talk maybe a little bit about the fluidity of a membrane. Why is it important that the membrane is fluid and what determines how fluid a membrane is going to be? So what we've learned as scientists is that the phospholipids in the plasma membrane can move within the bilayer, right? So they can move sort of laterally. Proteins can also drift laterally throughout the membrane. And the reason why we know that these proteins can drift laterally through the membrane is because we've done experiments to study this. So a uh, very simple but elegant experiment shown here on this slide. So what scientists did is they took a mouse cell and mouse cells have all these proteins on the surface and they labeled all those proteins using a pink fluorescent marker. And then they took a human cell and they did the same thing, but they used a blue fluorescent marker to label all the human proteins on the surface of the human cell. And then they hybridized the cells, so they squished them together. Uh, membranes are very pliable, right? So um, when you put cells really close together, the membranes kind of just fuse and it can create a hybrid cell. Now this is not some crazy mouse-human um, hybrid animal. These are probably skin cells which could never give rise to new um, organisms anyway. You're just looking at, at a hybrid cell that has parts of it from a human and parts of it from a mouse. And initially this hybrid cell would have blue on one side and pink markers on the other side. But as scientists let it sit, and they came back to take a look at it, let's say an hour later, what they would have noticed is the pink and the blue markers um, would have kind of all mixed together, indicating that the proteins, the lipids within that bilayer had to have the ability to sort of move around to disperse in such a way. So we know that proteins and lipids can move laterally. Think of uh, you know, something like a styrofoam cup floating on the ocean, as terrible as that it is to imagine, right? That styrofoam cup is not going to stay in the same place. With the undulations of the surface of the ocean, it's going to move around. Kind of the same thing for those proteins and lipids in the, phosphid, in the phospholipid bilayer. Now, on top of that, rarely a lipid can actually flip-flop transversely across the membrane. What do I mean by that? Well, if we go back for a second here, and we take a look at this section of the phospholipid bilayer. What if this little phospholipid here says, well, gosh, you know, I've been looking to the outside of the cell for a really long time. I want to see what the inside of the cell looks like. And what it would do is it would flip to the inside. So it would literally move from one side of the phospholipid bilayer to the other side. Now this can happen, but it happens very rarely. Think about why would this potentially happen with very great difficulty? It has everything to do with the fact that phospholipids are amphipathic, right? If you want to get this phospholipid to move over here, that means that you have to drag that hydrophilic head of the phospholipid through the hydrophobic core of the membrane to get to the other side, and it's not going to want to do that very easily. So this is a very rare occurrence. Typically, this flip-flopping of phospholipids is going to happen when the membrane gets remodeled in some way. Maybe a membrane, get, a membrane protein gets added or taken away or changes in some way that kind of facilitates this movement of the phospholipids to the other side. Okay, now when we were talking about macromolecules in an earlier chapter, we talked about fats, right? A fat molecule consists of a glycerol, and then you've got the three fatty acids. Um, phospholipids are very similar to fats, right? And they've got the glycerol, two fatty acids, and then the phosphate group. Now, when we were talking about fats, we were talking about how the three fatty acids in a fat, they can be all the same kind, or they can be all different, or two of the same, one different. We talked about saturated and unsaturated uh, fatty acids. Uh, we didn't exactly talk about saturated and unsaturated fatty acids when we talked about phospholipids, though. But the same kind of principle applies here. Just like if you wanted to make a saturated fat, you would use three saturated fatty acids to build the fat. Or if you wanted to make an unsaturated fat, you would use at least one unsaturated fatty, fatty acid out of the three fatty acids in that fat molecule. Well, phospholipids don't all have to be built out of the same fatty acids either. You can use saturated fatty acids 
or unsaturated fatty acids. And depending on what kind of fatty acids you use, that'll do slightly different things to that membrane in terms of its fluidity. Um, so let's think about this for a second. If you were to use unsaturated fatty acids, those that have the double bond between the carbons and the kink in the tail to build your phospholipids, this would end up creating a membrane that has more fluidity, meaning that it moves more. It is less viscous. So if you look down here in image A, here we have a higher proportion of those unsaturated fatty acids making up the phospholipids with a kink in their tails. And what you'll notice is that kink in the tail prevents the phospholipids from packing too closely together, hence maintaining more fluidity or more movement by making that membrane less dense. On the other hand, if you wanted to restrict movement in the membrane, make it less fluid, you'd want to opt for using more saturated fatty acids. So in this part of this figure, right, you'd have a more viscous membrane uh, because those phospholipids are using the saturated fatty acids, which have the straight tails. Um, it can pack a lot closer together, making the membrane more dense and less fluid. Now, who cares, right? Why does it matter to a cell whether the membrane is more or less fluid? Well, for a cell's membrane to be able to work properly, it has to maintain fluidity. Once that membrane kind of, let's say, freezes solid, nothing is going to be able to get across and the cell is either going to starve because it can't get nutrients in or it's going to poison itself because it can't get rid of the waste. So for membranes to be able to work properly, they have to be fluid. So it's interesting that some organisms can actually regulate membrane fluidity depending on the season to put in more or less unsaturated fatty acids to make sure that their membranes maintain the correct fluidity. Winter wheat, for example. In the winter time, their cells have a higher proportion of unsaturated fatty acids in the phospholipids. And then in the summertime, when it gets kind of hot, and they don't need to make sure that their membranes are uh, that fluid, uh, they can decrease the amount of those unsaturated fatty acid tails in the phospholipids to create a, a little bit more of a dense membrane. And so that changes for winter wheat based on the season. Now, on top of using the fatty acids in the phospholipids to regulate fluidity, uh, animal cells have an extra component that they can add to function kind of like a fluidity buffer. So remember we talked about buffers earlier in the semester when we were talking about pH. And a buffer in pH terms is something that maintains a constant pH of a solution. In this case, cholesterol acts like a fluidity buffer. It prevents the membranes from becoming too fluid or becoming too viscous. And so the steroid cholesterol does different things at warm versus cool temperatures. So for example, at warm temperatures, like 37 degrees Celsius, which is body temperature, cholesterol actually restrains the movement of phospholipids to make sure that the membranes of our cells don't just fall apart um, because we uh, maintain that very high body temperature. On the other hand, as temperatures cool, the cholesterol will do the opposite and it actually will maintain fluidity by preventing tight packing of those phospholipids. So you can see down here in figure B, you've got the cholesterol kind of interdigitated between the phospholipids. And so as the membrane cools and becomes more and more dense, those phospholipids can't pack really close together because the cholesterol is kind of getting in the way. And so the cholesterol helps to maintain some of that fluidity even though the temperatures might be really cool. Okay. So, so far, we've really only focused on the lipid component of a membrane. The lipids, the phospholipids or cholesterol, if it's an animal cell membrane, the lipids are going to maintain or regulate, let's say, fluidity, how fluid or how viscous a membrane is. But the actual function of a membrane really comes from the proteins that are embedded in that phospholipid bilayer. So now we're going to switch gears where we're going to talk about functionality. We're going to talk a little bit about those membrane proteins. And so again, we talked about how the membrane is a, is a fluid mosaic, right? So we have to look at this mosaic, this collage of different proteins that are oftentimes grouped together in the membrane in certain spots or places within that membrane to be able to accomplish, accomplish a certain job. 
Now, membrane proteins are a variety of different kinds. You can have peripheral proteins or you can have integral proteins. Peripheral proteins are going to be those membrane proteins that are bound to the surface of the membrane. So if we look at the figure over here, this guy right here is a peripheral protein. And this guy over here is also a peripheral protein. You'll notice how they're kind of just attached to the um, top or bottom of the membrane, but they don't really contact the hydrophobic core on the inside. The integral proteins, on the other hand, actually penetrate into the center of the membrane. So they touch that hydrophobic core where the fatty acid tails are. Now, integral proteins, this guy is an integral protein, this guy is an integral protein, and this guy is also an integral protein. There is a more specific kind of integral protein. These guys are called transmembrane proteins. And transmembrane proteins are going to be integral proteins that span all the way across the membrane. So they poke out on both sides. And this guy right here is a transmembrane protein. He's poking out to the outside of the cell and poking in to see what's going on on the inside of the cell as well. This guy next door though, this is just an integral protein. He's not a transmembrane protein because while he does look into the inside of the cell, he doesn't actually span all the way through to the other side to the outside. So this guy, transmembrane, integral protein, and this is just a simple integral protein. Now, many of these transmembrane proteins that span all the way across the membrane, uh, they oftentimes consist of multiple stretches of these nonpolar amino acids. So if we take a look at this bottom figure, here's an example of a transmembrane protein poking through on both sides. Now let's think about how proteins are built from amino acids. And we discussed how amino acids have different properties, right? Some are polar, some are nonpolar, some are uh, acidic, some are basic. Well, think about if you were to build a protein and you knew where it had to be within the cell, what kinds of amino acids would you use to build parts of that protein? For example, if you knew that this part of the protein right here had to face the outside of the cell where it interacted with an aqueous solution, very likely you would stick amino acids here that are polar and that are hydrophilic and can play nice with the water. Same thing goes on the other side, right? This part of the protein here, the polypeptide, should be made here out of those hydrophilic amino acids because, again, they have to play nice with the water, the aqueous solution on the inside of the cell. On the other hand, all of those amino acids that are hanging out here in the middle of this protein Right, they have to play nice with the fatty acid tails, right? These hydrophobic fatty acid tails of the phospholipids. So all these amino acids here, they have to be hydrophobic in order to be able to exist in that core of the membrane. One more thing to think about. What if this uh, transmembrane protein here was an aquaporin? Imagine like a big old donut, right? This protein is like a donut. And so it creates a nice safe passageway in the center of the donut for water to move across the hydrophobic parts of the membrane. So the pore in the middle of this membrane protein, it's got to be lined with amino acids that will play nice with the water that's going to move through that protein. So the inside core of that protein should probably also be made out of those hydrophilic or polar amino acids.